Excellent. Well, um, here we go, everybody. We're really excited here to, uh, to be here with Hannah Brody, um, who is going to share her family's story and talk about what um, you know, her, her family's history, her personal history, and to share some great lessons with us. Uh, I'm really excited to have our student interviewers today with us, McKenna Magnus and Margaret Burns and Anna Luisa Bacci. And we are um, excited to be here. So uh, we, uh, we have a format that's set up. The students will be asking some questions. Hanna will be answering and sharing us insights and we'll lead into what will be a great conversation. I'm just gonna ask everybody for the sake of our recording, when you're not talking to please put yourself on mute and that way it will uh, um, improve the quality of the sound. So thanks everybody and let's take it from there. Um, what was your family's life like before it was interrupted by the war? Great question. And the, because how do I pronounce that? I'm so sorry. the word is shala. It is shala. a it is a, it is a burning. So it's 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 a Hebrew word for the Holocaust. Uh, and this recording is actually for will become part of Yom HaShoah, which is a commemoration of the six million dying because it happened, of course, over a period of years. So there is a day designated as Yom HaShoah, Day of the Shoah, where we commemorate, and and that's that's where the term comes from. So my dad's village was um, was a third Jewish, and of that he was related to about half. So he grew up with a lot of relatives around. Um, everybody knew who he was. He had deep roots. He had a deep feeling of belonging, uh, something that I never had. And um, one time my dad and I sat down to count the immediate relatives who perished in the Shoah, um, aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents, and he came up with 92. So imagine those 92 having a chance to, to live a normal life, how large the Jakubovic branch would have been had it not happened for the Shoah. And my mother's family, um, they lived in a town and her family also, seven children and um, two parents during the war. So actually her family had a better survival rate and I'm not certain how many relatives or how different her life was, but definitely she was uprooted from the Hungarian part of Czechoslovakia into the Czech part, had to learn Czech again and live in an entire different environment than what she was used to. Um, are you ready for the next question? Sure, if you have no other questions, yes. Okay. Um, did your parents or grandparents share what, um, with you like what it was like when they were a teenager? They did. Um, my father more reluctantly than my mother. Um, my father had a great childhood. He um, was living in a village where they farmed and also were raising sheep up in the mountains. So he was definitely a country boy with a lot of freedom to run. Uh, and my mother lived in a small town where she was the youngest of seven children. So she was very coddled. Um, but as far as her teenage years, you know, she was 14 when she was taken away to Auschwitz, uh, when they were, her family was deported. So she didn't have too many teenage years. And what always struck me is my mother-in-law, American mother-in-law, he used to talk about the dances at the Jewish Community Center. When she was 16, how they would go to these dances. And every time she mentioned them and her life and how she would, they would crash weddings, I would think about where my parents were at that very same time. And my mother was in Auschwitz when she was 16. Uh, she was, uh, as I will describe later, she was suffering horrible things. And the only reason why one had different life from the other was geographical. And um, so that, that always stuck with me, is that the teenage years, which should be your best years, I mean, they're challenging, but they're also like a great time, right? You're discovering who you are, and you finally get some freedom from your parents, and, it's, and the dances, and the fun times, uh, learning how to drive a car, all those things that, that belong to teenage years were stripped away from them because of the Holocaust, and those were actually their very worst years. 
and also the physical aspect, right? You're growing. You, your nutrition is extremely important during this time. And of course, they had no nutrition. So also what it did to the physical aspect of their growth and how it stunted them. So things like that, that um, as they were telling me their stories were always running in the background. So while they had really great stories of, you know, little things that were happening, um, as teenagers, they didn't get to enjoy too many years before the war started. Any other follow-up on that? Do you want more detail? You good? Um, did it ever, like, make you feel upset when, like, you heard about your mother-in-law's teenagers versus your mother's? No, it didn't make me upset um, because, of course, I would not wish that on anybody. But it did make me feel um, robbed or lost on behalf of my parents because I realized how much fun they could have had or what, how differently their life might have turned out. Um, my mother's sister wanted to be a poet. She actually had a book published before the war. She was four years older than my mother, so she started writing when she was very young. And... Um, you know, she could have been a very successful poet. She could have gone to the university. But after the war, she never had any desire to do that. She ended up living in a small town and uh, raising chickens and being sort of a, a, a and was very, very sickly. So um, again, the, the difference of what could have been versus what the reality that was. Could I, could I ask just for further clarification? Um, it was mentioned before the Shoah. So is that um, Jewish, you know, the way that Jews refer to the Holocaust? Is that what? Uh, is that, uh, that is a Hebrew term that was coined um, in Israel. Huh. Um, that is how Israelis tend to re refer to it. So if you're speaking in Hebrew, you would use the term Shoah. But if you're an American speaking Jew, you would use the word Holocaust. Thanks for the clarification. Sure. Just, I'm learning along with everybody else. <laughs> um, the next question is, how do you think the war changed your parents or gra and grandparents? So um, only three grandparents were deceased of natural causes before the war, which was probably fortunate given the circumstances. And uh, my grandmother, who I'm named after by my middle name, Rivka, was uh, taken to the concentration camp, which we'll discuss later, um, how it changed them. So my mother, at the age of 16, had toes amputated on her foot, which was a result of a frostbite she received during the forced march. When it was apparent that the Germans were going to lose the war, they gathered anybody who was still alive in the camps and marched them toward Germany. Um, not quite sure why. We think they were going to be used as human shields or to work in the factories making bullets or whatever they needed them for. But this was a forced march, march in the month of March. It was very cold and she received frostbite on her toes and they had to be amputated. And at 16, she was begging a physician not to amputate her foot as well because who was going to marry her if that happened? So you can imagine that. Uh, both of my parents contracted tuberculosis as a result of their uh, experience. My father had a very bad back and a lot of physical pain that he never shared with me, but I found out about later as a result of all the beatings that he received when he was um, in the camps between the age of uh, 16 and um, 18. So um, those were the physical scars. Then there were the emotional scars. Um, you know, the memory of who was lost, um, the terrible nightmares that they had throughout their lives. And so that changed them. And I think also they, um, they were mistrustful of strangers. They tended not to go outside of the Jewish community very much, except my dad, of course, at work. So I, th I, think, it, I think it changed them. It, it, obviously, it has to change you. But on a positive note, I think that they, my dad got a uh, master's degree so he was his education was interrupted and this is something important for you kids because we're so worried about what's going to happen with your education with COVID losing that year you're going to lose a year of education please don't worry about it because my father was um, kicked out of school at sixth grade because he was Jewish and they were no longer allowed to attend school and um, after the war he got his GED he got his college degree and he got a master's degree 
all the but in uh, within 10 years so if that can be surmountable if that can be achieved then i think one year that you guys are missing as horrible as it is um, it is not going to affect the rest of your lives so rest assured teachers and students it's great perspective with what everybody's working through thank you right and i think that that is i'm sorry just want to say that and i will you know things are going to be a little bit out of order but um that is the living lesson of the holocaust so you're asking me questions about my parents and while they're very important to me and while it's a very good history uh, lesson in history it is still a growing lesson because there is there are so many things we can apply and even to today of what's what you're going through from the holocaust so it's not just a story that i'm telling you about my parents it it, it needs to be a lesson that you can take today as well and learn from um i agree with miss uh, mr wolovich and i understand and like everything you're saying um what do you, what do you think your family's life would have been like had it not been interrupted by the war what about your own life thank you it's a great question so um yeah and that's what makes me a different type of a speaker second generation speaker from those of my peers um you know the survivors are dying out or they're very elderly now so it has become incumbent on my generation as a second generation to tell their stories um what sets me apart and anna you can definitely identify with that is that we immigrated when i was 11 years old from the czech republic um, we did that because um, after the velvet revolution in the czech republic and that's a great lesson in history i know you said you're interested in history um, my father who had a very important job he was a um he was a statistician who set the prices of wheat barley and corn by the mar world markets for the whole czechoslovakian uh, country uh, was afraid that being jewish he might be thrown out of his job the czechs did not care about religion at all i grew up without an ounce of anti-semitism in my life but um if the russians occupied the our country as they did who were much more concerned about who was jewish and who was not he was afraid he would lose his job and that sort of set the wheels turning into us immigrating so i had to learn a new language um, i had to start anew um, i was in sixth grade and i was very tall and i didn't speak a word of english and nothing was um, set in motion in terms of educating me to have me learn Czech, to have me learn English. And um, for a year, I was uh, basically mute, you know, and I'm a, I love to talk and I couldn't communicate and that was horrible. So that was my, you know, I feel like that wouldn't have happened to me probably. Uh, my parents would have been surrounded by their relatives. My parents would have had aunts and uncles and cousins um, living nearby. I would have benefited from that. I didn't have that. So I grew up with my parents only and so-called aunts and uncles who were living near us, who were also fellow survivors that met up with my parents uh, after the war when they were all recovering in the Tatra Mountains, recovering their health, getting their strength. So that is where, that's the only relative so-called that I had. So had it not been for the war, um, I imagine growing up with um, many cousins around me. My cousins, they spoke all different languages. Um, I had cousins in Russia who spoke Russian, so I had to learn Russian whenever I went to visit them. I had a cousin in Hungary, so when we went to see him, I learned Hungarian. I don't know why I had to learn all these languages. Nobody learned mine, but somehow I did. So, and then when I came to America, I was able to find, I barely could speak with my American cousin who just had a bar mitzvah and i two months after he came and he spoke hungarian to me i mean english to me and i kind of spoke hungarian to him and we you know a lot of hands languages so imagine not being able to communicate with your first cousins and the war did that it scattered the family to three different continents to israel to russia to hungary to america and um speaking all different languages 
So I would say that that is the seminal thing for me. And my, of course, my parents not being near their siblings as or traveling easily to their siblings. And that, that was the change of having, um, being totally uprooted and not belonging where, where you were born or not being able to go back there. My father was actually, right before we immigrated to the United States, my father wanted to go back for the first time to his village. He was close before because my aunt, his sister lived only about an hour away from where they were born. But he could never go back because, and that's telling, right? That he could never go back to visit that village because it would have been so painful to him to see it. But he wanted to go back and the road was washed out due to storms and we never got to go back. So, you know, not being able to go back to ancestral home, to the cemeteries where people are buried, things like that, that definitely changed during the war. Um, if I may ask a question, were your parents ever able to make peace with um, what had happened to them during the war? Were they able to, to find a measure of comfort or um, peace afterwards? They were. And um, I must say that they were surprisingly normal for everything that they went through. Um, I know that a lot of it was, you know, sort of stuffed underneath. The survivors really for 10 years until um, the night came out with Elie Wiesel and all the books, uh, things were not spoken about because it was just painful. It was like, move on. And, um, and they were, they created a life for themselves in the Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia at the time. Um, they um, had a lot of friends. They enjoyed the symphony immensely. They enjoyed theater. Um, when we immigrated to America, my mother was finally reunited with two of her sisters and a brother. Eventually, my father's sister, was, who was in Israel, we were able to see. So they lived a, on the outside a seemingly very normal life. And my father uh, resumed. We always had religion in our lives, um, even in the, Czech, in the Czech Republic. But um, in America, he really was able to immerse himself again in, in, in the Judaism that he grew up with. Um, something that I always find surprising, I think that I struggle more with religion. Um, the question of where was God um, is definitely part of, part of what I struggle with. Uh, he did not seem, in spite of him having the experience, the physical experience, he did not seem to have that issue. And I think it was because that was his way. Religion was his way of connecting to the ancestors that were lost. Um, not instead of questioning. So I think that they, they lived a surprisingly normal life. Um, if I may ask another follow-up question. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned somewhere in that that you weren't re really able to communicate and see your um, cousins and your family's siblings and um, is were you not able to contact at all, like no letters or anything like that? Or were you able to like still send letters and um, still like communicate with them, even not seeing them face to face? Right. So in, um, after the war, um, since the Russians took over Czechoslovakia and became communist, mm -hmm. my parents could not communicate even with their um, siblings who were living in the communist bloc. So there were two siblings in um, Russia and you could not communicate. And there was one sibling in Hungary. And so there was no communication at all. Um, after 1952, so we're talking seven years after the war, they were able to make contact and write letters. And the letters were all censored at the time. So they had to communicate you know, via a certain language that they developed uh, certain code words so that nothing, when they really wanted to know how they were doing. As for example, like, um, are you able to get goods in the stores? Are they filled? You know, they couldn't just say that. So they had to, could develop, develop some kind of a language. They were able to see each other physically. So we used to get, every summer, we used to go on a train either to Budapest, which is the capital of Hungary, and visit with uh, my mother's sister, her husband, and my first cousin. And um, on the other, on the opposite summer, we would go to the Ukraine, which is the very start of Russia. And we, my mother's sister and my father's sister lived uh, relatively in close proximity. 
and would spend uh, quality time with them. So that's where, uh, so I did see them physically. Now, my American first cousin and my aunt, who did not have any children, um, brother and sister of my mother, um, my mother did not see her sister, who was the eldest, who kind of helped to raise her, until 1964. In 1964, uh, my American aunt was permitted to come to Budapest for a visit. And the sisters, the four sisters, were reunited for the first time since the war. So from 1945 to 1964, the four sisters were never in the same physical space. Now remember, this was days before the internet. So when you wrote a letter to each other, by the time the letter arrived, by the time the letter came back, everything was old news. So that was an emotional meeting. We have wonderful pictures of the families, of the husbands and, and the wife and the, and, and the uh, children that, were, you know, that each of them had, but not until 1964. Um, I know that you mentioned previously that like um, your parents' teenage years well, mainly your mom's teenage years were stolen from them, but what else was stolen from um, your family during the Shoah? Excellent question. So what was stolen from them was the, fam the sense of belonging, uh, their life, their dignity, their freedom. And I imagine that most of you, if you're fortunate in your home, have some kind of memorabilia from your grandparents, um, a, a chest or even a photo album. Um, in my father's family, two pictures survive one of my grandfather and one of my grandmother and her daughter at a, at a um, outside, they're just seated outside in front of a water cistern. And the reason why those two pictures survive is because my grandmother had an uncle, had an uncle who was living in uh, Brussels and she sent him those pictures and he, and he survived and he kept them. And there, so there are no pictures at all of my father, of his sister, of the other little brother, um, there is not one ounce of memorabilia. There's not a family Bible or anything like that. So my father had absolutely nothing that survived. Um, when he went back, and this is a story for another time, if I'm ever asked to go back, this, that's too much of a story. But when he was allowed to go back, once they were deported, he, they were deported to another town. And from that town, they were actually allowed to go back once in a while to get goods from their home. My dad went home one time and his home was stripped bare. There was not one thing left in the house. It was totally bare. And all the animals and all the livestock was, were gone. So he had nothing at all left from his childhood. My mother, um, they were able to take a pair of candlesticks, Sabbath candlesticks, a family prayer book and a set of china and they store them up in the attic. And when they return after the war, those items were actually there. So I do have the candlesticks. I don't have them to show you because they're at my daughter's house. I gave them to her on her wedding day uh, as a present. I passed it on to the next generation. I do have the family uh, Bible, which is uh, just beautiful. And um, it actually has an address in it from, for McKeesport, for some family in McKeesport. And, I, and it's barely legible. And I think it's really interesting that I ended up settling in Pittsburgh. Like it was, you know, there was this connection, but there were a lot of Hungarian, uh, Hungarians and Hungarian Jews settling in McKeesport to work in the still mills. So that sort of made sense. My aunt was actually asked to go there to work as a maid and did not. And so she had to survive. She had to go through the whole Holocaust experience. So that's what I feel is that I feel like I would have loved to have had something, a piece of furniture from my grandparents or, or something of importance, um, a pin, a piece of jewelry that most people have, that my grandchildren now have of mine or will have of mine, that they were robbed of having. Um, the next question is, what lessons or lessons do you think your parents, grandparents, relatives would want you to, would want? to impart with impart to young people today so that is important right as i said before that the history is the story of my parents lives is, is very interesting to and to be listened to in its entirety but um there has to be a lesson for it to be important not just be personal 
And I think it is that the human spirit is strong in the end and it prevails and it survives and scars and all, it goes on. And because as long as there is life, there is hope. And I think we all need to remember that. Um, there are, we all have hopeless moments at a time when we feel that something is, it will never be right again. But if it could be right for them, if they could maintain that hope and live through it, um, we all need to go on. And um, I, I think that is the most important lesson, is, is the will to survive is strong. Um, and if they could survive that what they saw, what they went through, then we can, should get strength from that and be able to survive whatever life throws our way. And I want to add a postscript to that in, um, in, in, that I admire for my parents so much. You know, you guys are teenagers, you come home, you had a horrible day, something horrible was said about you, how will you ever go on? And uh, we've all had those moments. And my parents never once said to me, oh, you think that's a problem? You should have, if you had any idea what I went through. I mean, I never heard that of my parents. And I think that that was so amazing and um, that they never made me feel that all my problems were just so, so minimal. I mean, anything, I, I can't think of one thing that I went through, even coming to America. I mean, I still have my parents with me and I, you know, I was still taken care of and I was still healthy and all I had to do was learn a new language and, and exist among people that, that I wasn't familiar with. And that was hard. That was probably the hardest thing I ever had to do. And never did they say, you know, that's nothing compared to what we went through. And I, I always admired that and appreciated that because all of us, um, our own pain is our own pain. But they never imparted that. They just imparted the goodness and, and what that we need to go on for, for on my behalf. I couldn't agree more with um, how you said like humans are like strong and after something like they can get over it. I know that it's sometimes hard, but like I've been through like I've had those kinds of days and like then I stop and think about what others have gone through. And I do feel bad, but like my parents are always there for me. So I do appreciate that. And I know like some people don't have that. So I'm very appreciative to have like the people in my life that I do have. And that, that's a wonderful thing, right? Is to, is to acknowledge um, what's wrong because you can't just say nothing is, of course, to, to acknowledge it, but then also to appreciate and to be grateful for what you do have. And if you practice that appreciation of what you are grateful for, what you do have, no matter how small it is, then, then you, you just feel better and, and it makes you, makes your day a little better. So that's so true. Um, are you ready for the next question? Certainly. Okay. Um, the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh has been around for 40 years. What, what role has the center played in your life and your family's lives? So the center has been very important because it has given a platform for the survivors to tell their stories, to have a central gathering place where they can tell their stories to each other, where they can just share their experiences, where can, they can just see how they're doing, be a support system to one another. So it was a gathering place and that was very important. When they asked, the survivors to record their stories. That was extremely important because it gave a voice to what they have suppressed. It gave a voice to the importance of what they experienced, that it was not for nothing, that it was going to be a teaching lesson, that it had meaning, that somebody cared about what they experienced. So that was a my, for my parents. For me, it was very important because it gave me a place to meet with other second generation and we talked a lot about our parents, the similarities that we experienced um, as a result of having parents who survived the Holocaust. And um, so it gave a safe place for us as well. And finally, it's a place where students come to, to look at the memorabilia that is left over from the war that people have donated, who have had something that, um, of donation uh, that they could donate. And um, students can come and they can hear 
as survivors speak, they can hear me speak, they can hear other second generations. Um, we, we go out to schools. So it has, it has served as, as, a, um, as a light that shines on, on what is what happened and what the lessons are and what needs to be learned from them. So very important. And it's in our community. So it's not just in Washington, D.C. We have a very great and strong community um, Holocaust Center in Pittsburgh. So you don't have to go all the way to Washington, D.C. To, to learn a lot about the Holocaust. Excellent. Um, you know, excellent perspective on that. And we've been fortunate in years, years back um, of, you know, I've been teaching for a little bit, got a few gray hairs on the chin. Um, and we've been fortunate some years back to have a opportunity for a survivor to come out to speak to our students. Oh, great. Um, and, you know, and it was a few years after that we would, um, you know, we were just asking internally, like, oh man, I hope they're recording some of these as, as folks are getting older. You know, these are stories that are worth, um, are, are not only were they're critical for people to be able to hear first person. So, um, you know, we've really appreciated the, the work of the Holocaust Center here in Pittsburgh and, and opportunities like this with you, um, the Waldman International Competition, which many of our students participated in this year. So there's just a wealth of resources. They are. If I might just say, I, I had the privilege of uh, accompanying a survivor and sort of introducing them at that time. And it was a very... Um, integrated um, sort of a, a school that um, might not have heard their story before and I was very concerned because the survivor had a strong accent as my mother parents did and I thought they're not going to listen there was a very tough kid in the front row this was high school that I would have probably crossed the street had I seen him and um, she, by the time the survivor was done speaking not only did he hear the survivor he actually had a tear rolling down his cheek and, and that, I'll never forget that moment, that um, to hear a survivor speak of their experiences, how it touched somebody who, who definitely had hardships of their own. But I imagine he had a lesson that he, that he heard from the survivor that applied to his own life. So that was, that was very seminal. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share with us about your family or like your experience that you didn't yet share yet? Yeah, I do. I, I think I just want to say that um, because of my experience as a child of survivors, I feel compelled to educate about the Holocaust, about the Shoah, um, to make everybody realize that both physical and emotional pain can be overcome, normalcy can be restored, and then we can go on to regenerate and ultimately even flourish. And to have a lesson that the Holocaust need not have happened. Um, it was a ultimate bullying experience where no one stood up against the bully and didn't happen overnight and it didn't happen in a vacuum. And there were a lot of people who helped. There were also a lot of people who stood up and, and help Jews uh, and those who are being persecuted. And I think that I want all of students to, I always end my lesson with this, to be upstanders and not bystanders. And what that means is when you see something that is unjust, stand up. If you see somebody who's not happy, say good morning, make them smile, ask them what's wrong. So even though you're just kids in school and middle school and you feel like, well, I can't change the world. Yes, you can't change the whole world. That is true. But you can definitely change somebody else's life around you. And I think that if you practice that, trying to help somebody out, trying to stop a bullying from happening, then when you are an adult and you have a little more say politically or otherwise, you can be the upstander. You can make sure that you will, that you will change the world and make it into a better place. And that's, I think, what's so important, such a lesson that I would like you to take with you as students um, of the Holocaust is to, that you, it, the power is within you to make sure that it never happens again. I think that's really powering. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there anyone 
for whom you light this candle? If so, can you tell us a little bit about this person, about that person? I would like. I would love to. Thank you. So I've thought about it, um, and I'm actually going to light it in memory of my grandmother Rivka, who I'm named after, and her two children, who she held by the hand as they walked in the gas chamber. Yehuda, who was ten, and Sina, who was eight. Um, my daughter is named after Sina, but Yehuda um, and my other daughter is named after Yehuda. There's a picture that I mentioned of my grandmother and her daughter, but there's no picture of Yehuda. And I want to light this candle in memory of the thousands of millions of children who there was no memory of, who never had a chance to realize their potential, and um, whose light was extinguished way before it should have been. So I am going to proceed light the candle. Thank you. Anna, thank you for sharing your your story, your wisdom, uh, your grace, and your lessons with us here today. Um, just really, really appreciative of um, you know so much that we can take away from today's conversation, both for everybody who is here on the call as well as um, the kids and and adults that will continue to be able to have thanks to this recording. So, truly appreciate it. Um, and just really appreciate your time today. The opportunity, thank you so much. The pleasure is mine and I wish you all so much luck going forward. And if you're ever interested in hearing my whole parent story, I'd be happy to do it via Zoom or, or in person next year. <laughs> so just all hang in there and we'll get better. Yeah. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.